Hello friends, I hope you are fine. In this video, we are going to read chapter 21 of the book written by G.C. Leon, which is titled as The Warm Temperate Eastern Margin, China Type Climate. So let us start. Distribution. This type of climate is found on the eastern margins of continents in warm temperate latitudes, just outside the tropics, figure 144. It has comparatively more rainfall than the Mediterranean climate in the same latitudes coming mainly in the summer. It is in fact the climate of most parts of China, a modified form of monsoonal climate. It is thus also called the temperate monsoon or China type of climate. In southeastern USA, bordering the Gulf of Mexico, continental heating in summer induces an inflow of air from the cooler Atlantic Ocean. Though less pronounced, the overall climatic features resemble those of the China type. It is sometimes referred to as the Gulf type of climate. In the Southern Hemisphere, this kind of climate is experienced along the warm, temperate eastern coastlands of all the three continents in New South Wales with its eucalyptus forests, in Natal where cane sugar thrives and in the maize belt of the Parana, Paraguay, Uruguay basin. As the regions are influenced by the onshore trade winds all the year round without any monsoon variations, the climate cannot be described as temperate monsoon. It is sometimes referred to as the Natal type of climate. Now, climate. The warm, temperate, eastern margin climate is typified by a warm, moist summer and a cool, dry winter. The mean monthly temperature varies between 40 degrees Fahrenheit and 78 degrees Fahrenheit and is strongly modified by maritime influence. Occasionally, the penetration of cold air from the continental interiors may bring down the temperature to freezing point. Though frosts are rare, they occasionally occur in the colder interiors. For most of the time, it is pleasantly warm. The relative humidity is a little high in midsummer when the heat becomes oppressive and can be very trying to the white settlers, example in Natal. Rainfall is more than moderate, anything from 25 inches to 60 inches. This is adequate for all agricultural purposes and the warm, temperate eastern margin climate supports a wide range of crops. Areas which experience the, this climate are very densely populated. Another important feature is the fairly uniform distribution of rainfall throughout the year. There is rain every month except in the interior of central China where there is a distinct dry season. Rain comes either from convectional sources or as orographic rain in summer or from depressions in prolonged showers in winter. Local storms, example typhoons and hurricanes also occur. There is a good deal of variation in detail within the eastern margins and it is essential to examine them by reference to a specific area where the local factors affect the climates. We shall subdivide them into three main types. The first one is the China type. Central and North China including Southern Japan, temperate monsoonal. The second one is the Gulf type, Southern Eastern United States, slight monsoonal. And the third one is the Natal type, all the warm temperate Eastern margin, non-monsoonal areas of the Southern Hemisphere including Natal, Eastern Australia and Southern Brazil, Paraguay, Uruguay and Northern Argentina. Now the first one, the China type. This is the most typical climate of the warm, temperate eastern margin. The great landmass of the Asiatic continent with its mountainous interior induces great pressure changes between summer and winter. Intense heating in the heart of Asia sets up a region of low pressure in summer and the tropical Pacific air stream is drawn in as the rain-bearing southeast monsoon. Heavy precipitation occurs in most parts of China, decreasing inland as illustrated in the figure. The wettest months of Nanking are in summer with more than a third of the annual rainfall falling in June and July, 15.3 inches out of 42 inches. Though the monsoon does not burst as suddenly nor pour as heavily as in India, in winter a steep pressure gradient is set up between the cold interiors of Mongolia and Siberia and the warmer Pacific coastlands, the continental polar air stream flows outwards as the northwest monsoon, bitterly cold and very dry. There is little rain but considerable snow on the windward slopes of Shantung as the cold winds are warmed and moistened. 
In fact, less than 8.4 inches are recorded in Nanking during the cold season from October to February. Another characteristic feature of the China type of eastern margin climate is the great annual temperature range. As shown in the temperature graph of Nanking, there is a difference of 45 degree Fahrenheit between July 81 degree Fahrenheit and January 36 degree Fahrenheit. Further north, the range is even greater 55 degree Fahrenheit in Peking and 54 degree Fahrenheit in Chang'an. The warmer south and along the coast, the temperature differences are much less. Example, 28 degree Fahrenheit in Canton, 27 degree Fahrenheit in Suetau and only 22 degree Fahrenheit in Hong Kong. Another climatic feature associated with the China type of climate in southern China is the occurrence of typhoons. Intense tropical cyclones that originate in the Pacific Ocean and move westwards to the coastlands bordering the South China Sea. They are most frequent in late summer from July to September and can be very disastrous. The winds blow with tremendous strength, the sky is overcast and there are torrential downpours. As much as 24 inches in a day have been recorded and flooding is widespread. In the Swato typhoon of August 1922, the huge waves set up by the violent typhoon droned as many as 50,000 inhabitants. Now the second one which is the Gulf type. The Gulf Atlantic regions of the United States experience a type of climate similar to that of central China except that the monsoonal characteristics are less well established. There is no complete seasonal wind reversal for the pressure gradient between mainland America and the Atlantic Ocean is less marked. As can be seen from the graph for Miami, Florida, the difference in temperature between midsummer July 82 degree Fahrenheit and midwinter January 68 degree Fahrenheit is only 14 degree Fahrenheit. The warm Gulf Stream and the onshore trade winds help to bring about this narrow range of temperature. Summers are warm and pleasant. Miami being an important holiday resort and it rarely snows in winter. The annual rainfall is heavy with 59 inches in Miami and New Orleans, 52 inches in Montgomery and 41 inches in Charleston. There is no distinct dry period as in monsoon lands and the abundant moisture has stimulated extensive cultivation of cotton and maize in the cotton and corn belts, both of which are the world's leading areas for these crops. From the rainfall pattern in figure, it is clear that there is a tendency towards a summer maximum brought by the onshore trade winds which swing landwards from the Atlantic. The amount of rain is increased by the frequent thunderstorms in summer and by hurricanes in September and October. Some stations, example Montgomery in Alabama, also show a secondary maximum in late winter when cyclonic activities are greatest. Sometimes violent tornadoes occur due to intense local heating on land. Though these whirling storms follow only a narrow path in the central plain Mississippi Basin, they leave behind a trail of destruction. Now the third one which is the natal type. There are three distinct areas on the eastern coasts of the southern continents lying just south of the Tropic of Capricorn which experience this type of climate. The narrowness of the continents and the dominance of maritime influence climate eliminate the monsoonal elements which characterize the corresponding climates of the northern hemisphere. The southeast trade winds bring about a more even distribution of rainfall throughout the year as illustrated by the climatic graph for Sydney, Australia. It has a mean monthly precipitation of 4 inches which is adequate for most agricultural activities. The annual amount of 48 inches is fairly representative of this climatic type in the southern hemisphere. The annual precipitation of Durban in Natal is 45 inches and that of Asuncion in Paraguay is 52 inches. The passage of depressions across the southern edges of the warm temperate eastern margins results in a slight autumn or winter maximum typified by Sydney, which has its wettest months in March, April, May, June and July, the autumn winter part of the year. The rain comes in prolonged showers. Much of the water seeps into the ground and there is little runoff, so the regions are well suited to agriculture and are some of the best settled parts of the southern continents. Another feature to note is the small annual temperate range. 
without any really cold month the annual range for sydney is 19 degree fahrenheit and the coldest month is 21 degree fahrenheit above freezing the range is smaller for durban only 13 degree fahrenheit with july the coldest month at 63 degree fahrenheit in asuncion it is even less the range is only 8 degree fahrenheit and the climate is pleasantly warm all the time however the southern continents also have violent local storms which do not as severe as the typhoon hurricane or tornado are nevertheless quite significant the southerly buster a violent cold wind blowing along the coast of new south wales leads to a sudden fall in temperature it is most frequent in spring and summer the corresponding cold wind in argentina and uruguay is the pompero which is often accompanied by thunder and lightning besides the rain and dust In southeastern Africa a hot dry wind called the bird wind comes down from the interior plateau it is comparable to the fohan and chinook and brings unpleasantly high temperatures and oppressive weather now we are going to read natural vegetation the eastern margins of warm temperate latitudes have a much heavier rainfall than either the western margins or the continental interiors and thus have a luxuriant vegetation The lowlands carry both evergreen broadleaf forest and deciduous trees quite similar to those of the tropical monsoon forest. On the highlands are various species of conifers such as pines and cypresses which are important softwoods. As the perennial plant growth is not checked by either a dry season as in the Mediterranean or a cold season as in the cool temperate regions. Conditions are well suited to a rich variety of plant life including grass ferns lianas bamboos palms and forest the well distributed rainfall all the year round makes the regions look green at all times it is interesting to note that the warm temperate eastern margins are the homes of a number of valuable timber species in eastern australia the most important are eucalyptus trees with scanty foliage and thick fern undergrowth some of the eucalyptus are very tall over 250 feet and they make hardy timber The Australian Alps of Victoria and the Blue Mountains of New South Wales have great reserves of temperate eucalyptus forests that make us part of the timber exports of Australia. From the forest of southeastern Brazil, eastern Paraguay, northeastern Argentina come valuable warm temperate timbers such as the Parana pine and the Quebracho, axe breaker and extremely hard wood used for tanning and wild yerba mate trees from which the leaves are gathered for making Paraguay tea. Today, large yerba mate plantations have been established to produce Paraguay tea, an increasingly important export item of Paraguay in Natal. The other food grains are essential. The Chinese peasants raise wet paddy or swamp rice in flooded fields that call for and hard labor for the greater part of the year it is said that nowhere else is there so much manual labor devoted to raise a food crop that gives so little economic return farming is usually on a subsistence basis despite increasing mechanization in paddy cultivation very few farmers actually make use of new machines because they are expensive and may be impractical in some areas the only progress that has been made is towards double or treble cropping which has increased the annual total rice production when compared with the rapid population growth of the rice eating nations the increased production has in no way relieved the critical food problem of monsoon asia Furthermore, milled rice, which forms the staple food of the Orient, is a seriously deficient diet. The people are therefore not only inadequately fed, also physically undernourished. Monsoon China has all the ideal conditions for paddy cultivation: a warm climate, moderately wet throughout the year, and extensive lowlands with fertile moisture, retentive alluvial soil, which, if necessary, can be easily irrigated. the land has been tilled from generation to generation and yet there is little deterioration in soil fertility the muddy irrigation water from the river basins is silty and constantly brings new soil to the fields the water is greatly enriched during floods though these are far less frequent now with the improvement made in flood control by the communist regime in practice the chinese peasants add all kinds of organic wastes to enrich their fields rice straw ashes clippings animal dung 
refuse and last but not least human manure the most intensively farmed areas are the basins of sikyang the yangtze kiang and huanghu which are also the most densely peopled areas the eastern coastlands are equally important as the flatlands are insufficient for rice cultivation farmers move up the hill slopes and grow paddy on terraced uplands the artificial terraces retain the excess water as it flows down the slope besides rice the other important crops are tea grown for home consumption and mulberry leaves gathered for feeding silk worms the sericulture is declining the second one is agriculture in the gulf states agriculture in the gulf states of america differs from that of monsoon china though they have a similar climate lack of population pressure and the urge to export make rice cultivation a relatively unimportant occupation it is grown only in a few areas in the southern coastlands of mississippi delta americans are bread eaters and one can well imagine how insignificant is rice in the economy of the gulf states the most important crops are corn cotton and tobacco the first one is corn the chief food crop raised is in fact corn or maize the humid air the sunny summer and the heavy showers suit the crop well it is grown right from the gulf coast to the midwest south of the great lakes with the greatest concentration in the corn belt of nebraska iowa indiana and ohio the region accounts for more than half the world's production of corn but only 3% of the world's export this is because most of the corn is used for fattening animals mostly cattle and pigs many farmers do not harvest the corn but instead allow the cattle or pigs to hog the corn down in the field itself the fattened animals are then sold to the meat plants in chicago and cincinnati to be slaughtered and processed into corned beef or frozen and chilled beef very little corn is consumed as a staple food in america though the cereal is originated in america as the food crop of the native indian people apart from its ease of cultivation in respect of soil climatic and labor requirements corn's most outstanding feature is its prolific yield it keeps almost twice as much food mainly starch per acre as wheat or other cereals this explains why it is so widely cultivated in both the warm temperate and the tropical latitudes the second one is cotton of the cash crops grown in the gulf states none is comparable with cotton in the deep south the fiber is so vital to the economic well-being of the southerners that cotton is king it shapes the destiny of the southern states being directly responsible for the trade prosperity and politics in the early days of america millions of negroes were brought from africa as slave labor for the cotton plantations because the climate was too hot for the white settlers to harvest the cotton themselves although slavery was abolished in the 19th century the negroes are still poor and underprivileged this is the cause of the present problems between the blacks and the whites in america the gulf type of climate is undoubtedly the best for cotton growing it's long hot growing season with 200 days frost free and a moderately high temperature of about 75 degree fahrenheit permits the crop to grow slowly and mature within 6 months like most fibers cotton likes ample rain and an annual precipitation of around 40 inches is essential in fact an adequate moisture supply coming from frequent light showers with bright sunshine between them gives the highest yield fine quality cotton also comes from irrigated fields in the drier west provided sufficient water is supplied during the growing season the cotton belt is thus limited by the 20 inch in shoyat USA is not the only important cotton producer and their largest industry is cotton textiles here yarn is being processed at the birla mills on the west and the 77 degree fahrenheit isotherm in the north within which there are at least 200 days without frost in the very south in the gulf lands the heavy rainfall damages the hill lint this area is therefore less suitable for cotton and is devoted to citrus fruits cane sugar and market gardening as in florida the commercial cultivation of cotton is now concentrated only in the most favorable areas which are the mississippi flood plains the clay atlantic coastlands of georgia and south carolina the black prairies of texas and the red prairies of oklahoma figure 146 shows the chief cotton areas 
Generally speaking, the best cotton comes from the maritime districts where the sea breezes and the warming effect of the ocean are most strongly felt. The sea island cotton grown in the islands of the coast of Georgia and South Carolina is long stippled. The fibers are between 1.5 and 2.3 inches in length and is the best in the world. Further inland, the staples are shorter, about an inch long. This is typical of the bulk of the American cotton. Besides the problem of soil exhaustion and erosion caused by prolonged cotton cultivation, the most dreaded enemy of the cotton belt is the bull weevil. The pest multiplies so rapidly that a pair of bull weevils, if left unchecked, will breed over 10 million grubs within a single season. The pest is responsible for the westward migration of the cotton belt. When it first appeared in 19, 1892 in the eastern USA, it attacked the Sea Island cotton. Aerial spraying with insecticides and the thorough burning of old cotton stalks have been found effective in eliminating the bowl weevil. Now the third one, which is tobacco. Another interesting crop closely associated with the Gulf type of climate is tobacco which incidentally is also a native crop of America. Though it is cultivated in many parts of the world and the finished products range from Turkish tobacco to Havana cigars and Malaysian cheroots, there is none so universally known as the Virginia tobacco. It is the raw material from which most of the world's cigarettes are blended to suit the smoker's taste. The humid atmosphere, the warmth and the well-drained soils of the Gulf states enable tobacco to be successfully cultivated in many the Many of the eastern states of USA, example Virginia, Maryland, Georgia, North and South Carolina, Kentucky and Tennessee. No less than half the tobacco that enters international trade comes from these states. Regardless of the views that doctors and school teachers may hold, cigar and cigarette smoking has long been a universal habit that cannot be dispensed with. It is the basis of an industry and provides through duty a valuable source of income to the government. The third one is crop cultivation in the eastern margins of the southern hemisphere. A close look at the economic map of the southern hemisphere will at once reveal the agricultural importance of its eastern margins which experience a natal type of climate. The warm moist summers and frost free winters not only support many crops but also animals. In the coastlands of Natal, cane sugar is the dominant crop, followed by cotton and tobacco in the interior. Recent expansion of these crops has come about with improved irrigation. Maize is extensively cultivated for use both as merely an important food item for Africans and silage an animal fodder for cattle rearing. But in comparison with the maize yield of the corn belt of USA, the African yield is rather low, often only half. Improvements can be made. If farmers attempt some form of crop rotation to arrest the rapid rate of soil exhaustion in regions of maize monoculture, scientific manuring and better methods of cultivation would raise yields. In South America, where rainfall is less than 40 inches, there is much grassland on which many cattle and sheep are kept for meat, wool and hides. It is the continuation of the Argentinian pampas. The mild winters mean that the animals can be kept out of doors all the time. The extensive natural pastures provide valuable forays for both cattle and sheep. The products from these two kinds of domesticated animals account for over three quarters of the annual exports of Uruguay. The remaining exports come mainly from wheat and flax. Further north in southern Brazil, the rainfall increases to more than 40 inches and forest gradually replaces grass. Here the important occupations are the cultivation of barba mate, paraguay tea and the lumbering of araucaria or parana pine. Cattle and sheep are reared and maize and cane sugar are grown. In eastern Australia, the moist trade winds bring heavy rainfall to the coastal districts and these are thickly wooded. Giant eucalyptus trees rise and one above the other right up the eastern highlands. But with the influx of European immigrants, much of the forest has been cleared for settlement and daring. The eastern margin of New South Wales was in fact the earliest part of the continent to be colonized. Beginning with Port Jackson, the present site of Sydney, the region is now the chief source of Australia's milk, butter and cheese. Besides cotton, cane sugar and maize which are increasingly grown in the north. With this our chapter ends. In the next video we will cover the next chapter. Till then listen to the audiobooks and study well. With this I depart. Jai Hind.